Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu studios of ThinkTech Hawaii. You'll notice the studio is being reconstructed. You can see all the structural grids and the bars in the background, but don't worry, we're going to bring you the show anyway, regardless of the particular construction state status here in the studio. Anyway, uh, this show is, uh, as we said many times before, is uh, known by the people that it brings on, not by the host. And uh, sitting next to me is Capano Kekueva from National Disaster Preparedness Training Center in Honolulu, right down the street. Hello, Ted. NDPTC. Yeah. The world's most unpronounceable acronym. <laughs> and, and that could be why you guys don't get a lot of calls. That's the main reason I wear the shirts. So okay, I remember uh, that advertisement. <laughs> okay, all right. So Capano's uh, consulting in a lot of aspects of uh, work done at, uh, down the street here at NDPTC. And we have standing by in Austin, Texas, we have Gene Robinson, who has been on the show once before. This time we have not only Gene, we have his background, and we have his airplane sitting behind him. And uh, Gene is a man of many reputations, I might say. And uh, uh, we won't go through your complete good side, bad side, balanced list, Gene, other than that uh, Gene is probably the, arguably the leader of search and rescue, UAS use of search and rescue, uh, perhaps in the world, certainly in the United States, and uh, gaining more uh, credibility all the time. So uh, once again, this show uh, gets its credibility by the people it brings on, such as the two of you. So we've got uh, discussions about that very issue, search and rescue. You represent disaster operations. Gene represents search and rescue. We have the Pacific, we have the continent. Everything's sort of tied together here. And you, Kimono, have been down in the, in the Indonesia recently and have seen yet a different perspective of the uh, topography and association of land mass and ocean and such, which is begging for long range. Mm -hmm. Guess what Gene does? Gene does long range U.S. work. Yeah. I think these tie together. And there's one more piece we won't be able to add in today. That's the drone racer piece, but we can talk about it. So tell us a little bit about this video. Yeah, Capone. sure. So I had the opportunity to travel with uh, Dr. Carl Kim, who's a professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Hawaii. He's also the executive director for NDPTC. And uh, this was through a grant by the USAID uh, to build capacity through training um, with local universities in Indonesia. And so uh, earlier this summer... In we disaster re re preparedness and readiness and these things. Yes, okay. disaster preparedness, readiness, uh, building capacity within uh, the communities that are being served, and to train the trainer, if you will, with the okay. local universities. So we spent a lot of time in the community with uh, BNPB, which is uh, Indonesia's version of FEMA, if you will, their disaster management organization. We traveled to a number of locations that are prone to hazards. Uh, this footage here is from the Parang mud volcano that's been going on for about 10 years now, where this mud uh, volcano has just been spewing mud, um, you know, thousands of it's a cubic mud pump, yards. Just pumping mud up out of the earth. Yeah, just pumping mud up out of the and earth. Flooding the area with mud. Flooding the area. Uh, a number of villages uh, have been destroyed and covered by the mud. So. Um, the footage that you see here, um, this is actually an example of using the, the small drone to, to do some damage assessment and to take a look at uh, this environment uh, that, that you wouldn't be able to get close to otherwise. So we see here, it's kind of hard to see through the steam, but there's actually bubbling mud uh, in, in this. And the this steam picture. is part of the mud too. It's hot yeah. mud. It's hot mud. Uh, so we're able to go out to this area that's, uh, that's been dried. Um, and fly around this area and, and do an assessment. Uh, so one of the... Uh, problems with this area is they're pumping this, uh, this mud into the river system. Um, it's an ongoing issue and they are building levees and expanding levees uh, all the time. And so part of what we wanted to do with the drone was uh, combine uh, traditional on-foot terrestrial uh, investigation with some aerial views. This is a view of uh, relocation village. Uh, here's a mosque that wasn't completed because uh, you can see in the background the mud was approaching and they just halted completion of this uh, particular mosque. So here. the mud is actually raising the sea levels over the ground level so to speak, is it? Yeah, so they keep building these levees and they keep raising Man. them higher and higher. Uh, this is another part of Indonesia where they're using, they're actually doing gravel mining here uh, as a way to uh, deal with the, the uh, blocking of that river um, and, and using gravel for building material. So we spent time with the uh, local communities, the uh, officials. Uh, this was uh, a project that, that really did involve um, uh, the local officials. Here we're taking a look at an uh, island that's being built. Um, and this is a new campus, a university campus that, that was built, currently unoccupied. Um, so they wanted to see what this looked like from, from the air. Um, and currently, because it's not being used, it's uh, 
you know, the, the growth of the, the forest around it. Uh, people are running cows and goats in this area. Uh, an important part of this was also uh, sitting down with community members and having them explain to us where the issues were in the local area. Uh, so we did these mapping exercises uh, around these neighborhoods in Indonesia. So coupling um, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge with the community, um, doing surveys on foot, which we'll see here. So you're kind of doing a systems engineering approach yep. to resilience in this case, looking at all mm -hmm. factors, the needs of the people, and uh, the physical as well as the cultural aspects, yep. emotional and public, public health, mm -hmm. and then tie them all together into a, uh, a picture of the situation yep. and then figure out where you can go affect it, including with UAS. Yeah. You notice I didn't bring my drone with me because uh -huh. that's actually kind of a secondary issue. It was just yeah. a small part of this overall process. Here that's we are an on important the message, isn't it? Yes. That we need to make sure people understand. Absolutely. So here's Dr. Carl Kim. Um, uh, actually, we were on the ground taking a look at some flooding areas. One of the issues that was expressed was... This is with your was, drone, is it not? Yes, this uh -huh. is the drone. Um, I got some cameo shots of myself in here. <laughs> but uh, flooding <laughs> okay. is a big issue. This particular town, you see little dark pockets in the neighborhood. That, that's actually water. This mm. was reclaimed uh, ocean. So, so all mm. these homes were built on top of what used to be ocean. And this is going to get worse as sea level it's rise occurs. It's going to get worse, oh. exactly. Okay. And so one of the complaints that they had was about uh, flooding. And we take a look at the drainage canals here. Um, and th there are perspectives of these drainage canals that you can only get with mm. something like a drone. Perspective that you can only get with drones. That's mm -hmm. a really important piece of message because the locals yeah. could immediately understand the situation mm -hmm. they're facing as well as can we. And so and you could have analysis done by people around the world. Sure. You don't have to have it done right there locally. No. Um, here we see people were growing things in the drainage wow. canals. Um, the, these last couple of clips here, we were invited by the Sultan of Tidori, uh, who is one of our partners uh, in this effort, to come and take a look at uh, this is. Uh, this is an old Spanish fort that was built, uh, you know, colonial days. And so there are these national treasures that uh, obviously they, they want to protect. Um, and getting an aerial view of, of these uh, buildings, um, you know, helps them understand potential threats, uh, hazards, and, um, you know, what they need to do to, to remain resilient. This is cool. And so what we're talking about here is a, a a emerging and a developing area that's undergoing a lot of stress, a lot of pressure uh, economically, mm -hmm. uh, environmentally, and from the weather and cultural changes, all this together. Then yes. The better we can illustrate that and express it in terms of it, the, the cause and effect pairs that are going to be affecting it, the better people will be able to understand their situation and take action to prepare. Yeah. And these islands, as you showed, are not going to be necessarily close together. So that brings in long distance, right. and it all brings in unmanned air systems, and that brings in Gene Robinson. Great segue. And so let's, let's talk to Gene a little bit. Uh, Gene, having seen that, and with that uh, unbelievable experience you had recently of pushing that uh, uh, UAS behind you 450 kilometers, uh, about 200 miles, as I recall, something like that. Uh, your thoughts, sir, on uh, taking your basis of knowledge of search and rescue and that type of uh, disaster response action into a domain like you just saw. How do you see all that coming together? Well, it's, uh, it, it's not only the aerial perspective, but it's also the dwell time involved. Uh, well, you know, like you said, you, know, you can go up there and you can watch things unfold as they happen. And I, I think that's an important uh, aspect to using that aerial view is to be able to stay up there a long time. The particular flight that uh, occurred here this last weekend where we went uh, the 260 miles uh, took place over a course of about eight hours so you can stay in the air for eight hours we're, we're looking at some solar solutions as well that would essentially leave you in the air all day uh, if you needed to island hop I don't know how far apart the islands are but uh, you can potentially island hop uh, you can make a trip there make it back you can collect the data and uh, you can you could also distribute it from the air if you needed to. Uh, so there, there are so many different ways that you can use the endurance and you can use the, uh, the lift capacity of the airframe to aid you in that disaster mitigation. That's interesting because I hadn't thought about it, but the dwell time and observing the pattern as it evolves uh, is certainly going to be useful. And you mentioned earlier before we even began that the short battery life and mm -hmm. the short flight times do change how you use these systems. Yeah. So if you had functionality like Gene's talking about, this may once again open up another domain of how this might, how this might altogether be used. 
Gene, uh, tell us a little bit about that record flight that you put on a couple of weeks ago, or last well, week. Yeah, it was performed Saturday uh, in New Zealand by uh, Mr. Tim Benson out there. Uh, it is using the Vigilant C1 bone stock. There was nothing, no other modifications done to it other than uh, the flaps were disabled because we wanted to save the weight. Uh, it, it ended up being a factor on down the road, but the only time you use the flaps is when you take off and when you land, right? Uh, and that's like one-tenth of one percent of the entire flight. Uh, the aircraft was launched uh, using lithium-ion batteries, cylindrical. We'll, we'll, we'll put your video up and uh, keep, keep talking through it. We're going to put your video up, Gene. Okay. Uh, the, that aircraft used uh, cylindrical batteries, the lithium-ions. They weren't lithium polymers which was uh, a little bit of a departure. Uh, they, they tend to, to hold their peak charge longer and the, the, the discharge ramp drops off very quickly. But uh, it was uh, seven hours and approximately 50 minutes of flight time, uh, running about a two kilometer lap, if you will. Obviously we couldn't go the full 260 miles across New Zealand. It's a, it's a little bit bumpy in New Zealand. So, uh, they, uh, Tim set it up so it was very near the shore, a very nice open area. And uh, given that it was in a turn, it's pretty much uh, the entire time that it was flying. We probably could have squeezed a few more kilometers out of it if it would have been a level flight. So it was pretty exciting for us to, to get to the, uh, the 300 kilometer mark. And then, of course, uh, Tim was uh, sending us the updates after that because he had already used our Vigilant E, which is the foam version of that aircraft and gone 300 kilometers. Is so, this a homegrown aircraft that you designed yourself? Uh, my, my partner, John Smith, uh, designed this aircraft and uh, we've had uh, a batch of them manufactured in both foam and in uh, composite materials. Uh, the one that you see behind me is composite and uh, made out of very lightweight carbon Kevlar and honeycomb material. And that's the one that was used for the 425 kilometer run. Uh, it's got a lot of room in it. You can put a lot of stuff in there. So we uh, loaded it up with batteries and uh, cut her loose. And it was a very important research flight for us because we're looking to go solar and we needed to know just exactly how efficient the airframe would be once it got in the air. Let's, so, let's, uh, let's think about this uh, and, and talk about this after our first break. We do have a break in this show. We have a half hour total and we'll take a break in a second here. But as we get back, we'll talk about how the, the particular territorial domain that you were in recently and knowledge of what we have here in Hawaii and the long distance or the long orbit time that uh, Gene's talking about, how they might come together from the perspective of the user requirements. We'll come back and talk about that after our first break. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon! ThinkTechHawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Hi, and thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Justine Espiritu, and I host the Hawaii Food and Farmer series with my co-host Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. Every week, we bring on farmers as well as all the other individuals and organizations that help support a thriving, sustainable food system. In fact, it's interesting to learn what others are doing so you don't have to be a Hawaii resident or producing food on Hawaii to be featured on the show. Like today's guest, Wyatt Bryson of Jewels of the Forest and Michael Lab Solutions. Aloha. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Um, I love uh, seeing what you guys do and I really support your mission. And uh, it's really nice being back in Hawaii. And uh, thank you again. It's an honor. So you can see guests like Wyatt every Thursday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Live again here, folks, second half of our show, Where the Drone Leads, Ted Ralston in our studios in downtown Honolulu. You'll be joining at the studio, Kepano Kekueva. And in Austin, Texas, we have Gene Robinson. Uh, just showed us a great uh, film clip of a world record electric powered unmanned air system staying aloft for eight hours, which translates into about 260 or maybe longer than that, uh, linear miles if it were on a, on a straight, straight course. But that, that flight that, he, that Gene showed us really opens the door to a whole different way of thinking. And uh, Kipano and I were talking at break, Gene, about uh, how three of those 
could orbit a disaster situation continuously. If you had three of them, you had two sitting down doing battery charging and then, and then uh, uh, launch them in sequence. So providing communications, providing surveillance, and uh, Kipano mentions, of course, that any kind of payload we add on is going to degrade the emission time unless you have solar as a replacement or soaring management or some other weather optimization to manage. But th those are all coming, aren't they? Now, those are going to happen. Yeah, they, they really are. You've already got uh, thermal detectors in airplanes. They're very small. But you can put them in there. You've already got uh, uh, autopilots that have embedded uh, processing in them so that if they do detect a thermal, they can take advantage of it, climb the altitude, conserve power, use the solar to store back into the batteries. And we're, we're really hoping that uh, we can reduce the battery load with thermal management and that sort of thing, and especially in the islands. You get a lot of trades, you get a lot of ridge lift. Uh, you can you can go into the ridge lift and, and get a lot of altitude. Your communications are restored. Uh, there's so many different options that we can look to. Uh, That's exactly right. Here on Akoa Laos, on, I don't know if you've been here to Oahu, to our island, Gene, but uh, the updrafts on the windward side of the Koa Laos are about 2,000 feet per minute. So you can, you can scream, you can actually pick the speed up, you can do a lot of nose down and still retain altitude. Of course, once you get away from the mountains, you'll lose that. And, you, and on, on the other side, on the leeward side, it's quite a different story. But uh, certainly uh, topographical and thermal management would lead 25 to 50% uh, to a higher level of optimization of the mission. And it hasn't really thought about that. And, and Gene brings up a really good point, you know, as the sensors and, and the, the processors improve over time and get smaller, draw less power, uh, I mean, we're continuing to, you know, benefit from Moore's Law, if you will, yeah. uh, you know, the payloads get lighter, and mm -hmm. so we can do more with less, and, and, you know, the amount that the technology has progressed, at least in the, in the consumer drone space, the, the Phantom 4 that I flew in Indonesia, is incredible. Over two years, um, you know, I, I hesitated buying one because I knew that uh, um, I would be jumping into it and, um, you know, wouldn't necessarily have a lot of time to train on it. The Phantom 4 practically flies itself um, compared to the previous generations of, of small quadcopters. And so they're getting easier to use. Um, they're more accessible. The one I picked up, I actually bought at the Apple store, <laughs> at Kahala Mall. So um, the capabilities are improving. They're becoming easier to use. Uh, so. Like I said, it, it's becoming, the technology piece of it's becoming less of the issue. I think the more interesting conversation these days is how do we integrate it into, into the jobs that we're trying to do. Bingo, and how do we take it, how do we get the users, the in-state users, the most needed, the people who best understand the needs to define to us the total mission and the total operational needs and the sensor needs and this sort of thing. Or they may not be able to describe them in the terms we use, but they can describe them from what they want as a takeaway and we could then filter that down to what the sensor needs to be. Gene, you're, in your work, you are at the absolute cutting edge of this. You must see that same situation, that the, it's very difficult for the users to have a clear articulation of what their real needs are. So collectively, how do we push forward and get them to define that? Really, it is, it is an education process that you have to go through. And a lot of times you have to do the research for them so that they understand what they can derive or, or what benefit can be derived from either imagery or video or, or uh, ortho mosaics or that sort of thing. Uh, volumetric, I'm thinking in my head, GIS and volumetric measurements of the mud flows would uh, probably be a real benefit for those folks to know just how much is coming, where it's going, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, and as the sensors get better and better, that's going to be getting closer and closer to real time. And the processing downstream will take care of it so that you can get that information out in a timely fashion. And that's really, in a disaster, that's the key, is to get it out in a timely fashion. So then we're talking about uh, the, the timely fashion is a really important piece. That implies communication, that implies analysis, that implies expression of result, and making it in such a way that a decision maker, an incident commander, can understand it and make the correct decision. So there's a whole dimension here, which is all the analysis and the expression layer that we, it doesn't show up in the UAS itself. You know, I'm just thinking about something. IAEM uh, is having its annual meeting in about a month in, I think in, in the Georgia. And Mike Brown, a colleague, is uh, presenting there, and he wanted to present almost the same case. Uh, he wants to take to the IAEM the message that the rapid evolution of droneism 
could be considered a disruptive factor in how IAEM thinks. And he wants to express some of these issues and push them out there and disturb the system and get them to start paying attention to the fact that defining needs would be really useful to all of us. So Gene, let's collaborate on that. Uh, I'd like to take your video and some of the thoughts you've even suggested here and write up a, a, a couple of charts that we can all agree on and uh, push them out to IAEM in a month. How would that be? I think it's a great idea, and uh, the amount of data that we can collect and push is disruptive. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of one of the, the, the drawbacks of a new technology. You can't drink as much water as you'd like to drink out of that fire hose. Well, that's, that's exactly right, and in fact, uh, uh, it, it, we don't. We probably need to think about that in regard to NDPTC well, as well. We Gene, I want to kind of circle back on something sure. that Gene touched on, which is education and training. <laughs> you know, yeah. And that's uh, the, the T yeah, uh, right. in, in okay. the logo, right? And, and part of the reason we went to Indonesia was to actually explore the use of a small drone um, in, in an educational environment. Uh, we were working with the universities there uh, and developing capacity for the universities and seeing how this technology could be used and, and folded into that. So, yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, 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 most people are probably familiar with what drones can do, but uh, bringing that into uh, a training environment, into an educational system, uh, proving it out, um, you know, is an important part of this process. And I think we can use the professional organizations like uh, IAEM uh, and such to, uh, to start taking some ownership of this, of this, the requirements at the fringe. You know, Gene, we had a, uh, a similar discussion with the NFPA, National Fire Prevention Association, back in, I think it was in May, uh, at their conference, and uh, they got the same message that, hey, we need to ask the firefighters at the, at the, at the, at the frontier, at the front, at the, where the stuff burns, what their real needs are, and get those articulated and written down to bring back, to avoid the situation we have where it's the manufacturers driving the end solution rather than the user generating a demand. So NFPA saw that picture. They'd like very much to do that. We can take that story to IAEM. And I'll send this video tonight when it shows up to a colleague in, uh, in, in Georgia, um, Dr. Michael Brown, who'll be making that pitch. And this will get him all spun up big time. So this will be good. We'll, uh, we'll have some fun with this one and, and try to stimulate these professional organizations to, to, to push beyond what they know and, and, and help generate these requirements. And, Gene, you must run into this all the time in terms of the, especially with, I mean, I just can't believe it, 250 miles, eight hours of duration. Nobody thinks in terms of those parameters, unless you're in the military, where you're thinking of it in, in a, you know, at, at, uh, at 150,000 bucks a pop for an airplane. But in, in this scale we're dealing with here, it just, uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a whole state change in terms of capability. It is. and. Uh Unfortunately, we're going to get back into the perspective of data on this because <laughs> yes. eight, eight hours of data is a lot of data. The, the more data you can collect and the more you have to interpret. And uh, uh, again, uh, what uh, Capano was, uh, was leading up to is, is important. Whoever your audience is, whoever is looking at it, their perspective is going to be different, whether it's an agronomist or an engineer or uh, a, a firefighter. They look at the same picture and they'll derive, you know, three or four other different perspectives that you as the operator never thought about. And it's so important to get that input so that we as manufacturers and operators of the system can supply them with the data that they, they find useful. Well, you know, there's, a, there's an allegory here. A couple of years ago, we went up in the mountains here with the local fire department. and. Uh, equipped with uh, thermal infrared, thinking that's what they wanted to find, the fires that were burning in the low-level uh, uh, mulch and such uh, in very, very difficult terrain. Turns out that uh, even though the thermal infrared could find the hot spots, that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted smoke. And smoke is what they use as the identifier of where to take the firefighters. They drop firefighters in the black next to the smoke. That's how it works. So we re-equipped with smoke, and that, that was okay. But then came the issue that, okay, the Latin long and geoterms don't fit the picture of the grids that are used in the uh, in the topographical maps, so we don't have a connection between what we can sense and what is useful to the commander. And the third thing you come up with is that, okay, who's actually going to stand there and look at this thing? It's not me, the battalion commander. I don't have anybody who can spend, who's not assigned to go do something. So uh, it all comes back to the issue, as Gene was saying, of more data requires more analysis. We, we really have to get into the world of auto, auto, autonomous analysis and extraction in yes. some way that we haven't gotten to yet. Yes. So uh, 
Maybe what we could do is take IAEM's needs and NFPA's needs and, and start aiming them in that direction of automatic analysis and feature extraction and such that would be, uh, that would, that would be really what they would pay attention to. Totally agree. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let the computer work for you. Let me just throw one more thing on the, on the table here in the, in the remaining minutes we've got. Uh, I was going to show it on the show. We don't have enough time for it, but uh, drone racing, which is a term I wouldn't normally use. Normally, I would have disciplined myself for using that term, uh, is really incredible. Drone racing, I will restate it as uh, multiple change, uh, strings of incoming information, maybe five deep, recorded in 1D or 2D, but, but converted in your mind into 3D, making decisions in a really dynamic situation, tight uh, tolerance to obstacles in order to get around a course quickly, that's what drone racing is. It's really about see and avoid in a surrogate environment, which is one step away from detect and avoid, which is the kind of automation we need to get into. And secondly, on the drone racing, there's so much performance margin, just like Gene has, has uh, as endurance margin in his system, mm -hmm. the drone racers have incredible performance margin for rapid and high rate uh, um, motions. Climbing yeah, if you look at the uh, the spectrum, uh, Gene's uh, on one end, trap, yeah, high endurance. The quad that I was using is in the middle. In the middle, and then it, you got these really tiny uh, drone racers uh, that that are really fast and they're nimble but you know the batteries last uh, in minutes like but you know for a for a test team going forward uh search and rescue team or even a fire team going forward uh 500 meter radius around mm -hmm. them is kind of interesting that's kind of about that's the day's job sure. and you can get that covered in two minutes right at the nap of the earth so really close in and you can get into tight spots you can't otherwise mm -hmm. get into and therefore you can get by with very yeah. inexpensive optics because you right. don't need a lot of you don't have a lot of r squared hurting you so uh, we want to bring that into the equation, Gene, sometime either on a show like this or when you come out here, and we'll do it for real face-to-face. -face. You and bet. I think that stuff is way cool. All right, man. And we uh, really appreciate you coming on from Austin, Texas, with that water cooler behind you to keep you hydrated. And thanks again, Gene, for coming on. And uh, Capano, thanks for coming on first time. Right. First time running a show. And there's Glad no last here. time on the show. You know <laughs> that, right? Thanks okay. for having me, Ted. All right, man. See you guys all next Friday.